We at The Intercept are delighted to be the media sponsor of this very important and timely event. Um, at a moment when we see political violence around the world, um, assassinations, and, um, and it has become extraordinarily difficult to get to the bottom of the people responsible from, for some of the um, gruesome crimes that we witness every day. Um, so it's a very timely to be gathered for a conversation about what we're afraid of. Um, often the, the threats that we as investigative journalists and, um, and more broadly people in the adjacent communities of uh, the anti-war community and human rights investigators are, are mainly focused as their adversaries on the, the powerful institutions and individuals governments and corporations um, that have often have um, laws on their side and also powerful surveillance technologies that they deploy in order to protect and insulate themselves um, from transparency and the, the truth that, uh, about the, the lies and corruption that we are trying to expose. On our side, however, we also have laws. In the US, we have the First Amendment, um, and we have the power of investigative journalism. So um, it's that you know, dynamic that we're gonna talk about today. Um, we're gonna speak about what, what we should be afraid of um, with a number of people who have deep experience going up against this kind of powerful adversary, and who have each had extraordinary su success um, and I think we can be heartened by. Um, so while, you know, I don't think we should uh, be afraid to say when we are afraid, <laughs> um, I think it's also important to remember how we can win. Um, and just, and, and I'm gonna ask each panelist after I introduce them to talk about, you know, one of the, the most formative experiences in their careers where that have, th that made them realize just what we're up against and, and how we can surmount um, those obstacles. Before I do that, I want to say a little bit about in my immediate life as editor-in-chief of The Intercept. Um, we, we have a bureau in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, um, and uh, the, that country is on the cusp of electing a truly scary fascist, uh, Jair Bolsonaro. And um, he has enormous power through his relationships with media institutions. And right now, we are under uh, a vicious uh, and highly orchestrated uh, assault by one of those media institutions. Um, and the laws there are not very protective of uh, freedom of speech. So um, the whole question of the threats to investigative journalism are very much on my mind today. Um, so I just want to introduce people in turn. Um, so we have um, Ian, Co Ian Cobain on the far left. Um, he is a senior reporter for The Guardian and the author of Cruel Britannia and the History of Thieves. His inquiries into the UK's involvement in torture since 9-11 have won a number of major awards, including the Martha Gellhorn Prize and the Paul Foote Award for investigative journalism. He's also won several Amnesty International Media Awards. And I mean, to me, his reporting is in a model of how patient, determined investigation of the darkest corners of our, you know, deep state um, can really produce a meaningful change in the world. So, very lucky to have Ian here. Um, we also have John Getz, who is an investigative journalist um, at, a at ARD Hopstadt Studio in Berlin. Previously, he wrote for Der Spiegel until 2011, and together with the Danish documentary filmmaker, Paul Eric Heilbuth, he wrote and directed the 2015 documentary, Terminal F, Chasing Edward Snowden, which won a number of awards. So great to have him here. Last but not least, we have Duncan Campbell. Um, he's an investigative journalist, author, consultant, and television producer specializing in privacy, civil liberties, and surveillance issues. His best known investigations led to major legal clashes with successive British governments, including the first feature story ever published about the GCHQ. Duncan wrote about his extraordinary career in one of the first major pieces published at, under my tenure at The Intercept. Um, it was titled GQHQ and Me. And I just want to read one sentence from that article. <laughs> Here, it's quite an extraordinary sentence. 
Okay, in my 40 years of reporting on mass surveillance, I've been raided three times, jailed once, had television programs I made or assisted making banned from airing under government pressure five times, seen tapes seized, faced being shoved out of a helicopter, had my phone tapped for at least a decade, and been lined up to face up to 30 years imprisonment for violation of secrecy laws. So that's quite something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one more thing is last night, uh, he had the extraordinary honor after founding um, the, the UK's now hu huge and hugely effective LGBT equality group, Stonewall. Um, he won an award uh, that was handed to him by Tony Blair. <laughs> <laughs> and preceding his appearance was a pre-recording from Theresa May utterly condemning her party's previous notorious hate laws and supporting the right to love who you wish. So that really does show that, you know, yeah, yeah, they do. So, um, yeah, Let, let's start with you. Thank you, Betsy, and it was uh, fantastic to actually work with you to get that story out. The conference organizers asked me to focus on contemporary surveillance and official secrecy as well as everything else we're addressing. But first of all, to say what I most fear, and actually, now it isn't official secrecy or the mass surveillance that we've written about and care about so much. It is the cult of unreason, of fiction that people want to believe, the placing facts, um, the poison that is caused by tribal-based reporting. And you've just, you've given me another example, and in the fear of sexual equality, I heard of another stirred-up hate campaign. The shortest way I've heard of this being described is tribal epistemology. Knowledge is derived from what you want to believe and not the craft and diligence of the kind of work we do and we hope you endorse. This is going to run through the next couple of days. So, other than absolutely endorsing James's call that reporting should be driven as far as possible by repeatable, testable, uh, well-researched inquiries, that's the way we go forward. And that is also the way science goes forward. Science has its disadvantages, and this is one of them. That's probably the best possible slide showing the whole network of global surveillance. I'm going through this at a fast lick. That is the nature of the conference. That is the world created by the data buccaneers, probably the single most powerful slide that Edward provided. This shows the number just the numbers as of a few years ago, the scale of interception, the five agencies, they're called five eyes. They are, despite Edward and everyone's best efforts, secretly expanding. New treaties, new alliances, um, and in their more open uh, format, as we may hear, demanding new powers into crypto. Um, this is an incomplete list of the 30 plus countries that secretly collaborate with them. There's others like Switzerland and, yes, Saudi Arabia, who are in there too, but they're too sensitive to actually appear, even at top secret level. And then you have the major information companies, many, all the top names that we know running the internet in secret paid for collaborations. There are more than 80 major global corporations involved in this, largely driven not by patriotism of one kind or law, but by massive covert payments. Massive data collection against citizens, collection without prior cause to suspicion, a complete offense against the Fourth Amendment, the United States, has been going on for years behind our backs. This didn't come from Snowden, it came from a fantastically effective case uh, brought by the British NGO Privacy International. One, one little giveaway, though, is from Snowden, GCHQ's project to master the internet. So, the global surveillance system now includes more than 20 covert centers tapping international cables in blue, more than 50 worldwide satellite interception centers, thousands of infiltrated routers that are at the heart of the internet reeling our data, and literally, by now, millions of computers, individual computers, implanted with malware by many governments, not just the Five Eyes, to get access to people's secret information. And yet, this isn't news. 30 years ago also, um, I wrote 
about a secret project called Echelon. This was built, I said, at the heart of the Cold War, and the target was not the Soviet Union and its allies, it was us in the West. Many people thought that that was conspiracy theory because it wasn't what they wanted to believe. The fact was that Echelon was a conspiracy of secret agencies unknown to even most governments. But, thanks to Edward, thank you Betsy, in the Snowden Papers, 30 or 27 years later, that, was, that deduction from observable facts tested by science proved to be exactly correct to a letter. Echelon was established to collect and process Intelsat, that's our satellites, not the Soviet satellites, at the height of the Cold War. That's where the money went. We were the targets, even at the height of the Cold War. It wasn't conspiracy theory. That was the conspiracy theory speaking. It was true. And going back, I've also experienced personally, and I've never really talked about this before, one of today's hot topics, because all the way through the Cold War, uh, I was getting Russian disinformation. Now it's become slightly challenged to say, oh yeah, this is disinformation coming from the Russians. But I can reveal today for the first time that I really know that it came from the Russians. Uh, disinformation Nazo was invented at this very time. And here's my personal compromat. Mm. Oh, that hasn't come out very well, has it? Um, yours truly, coming out of the Lubyanka building. I've just spent the day in there. I've even sat in the uh, general secretary's desk and looked at the, the knobs and dials that controlled the links to the oblast. Uh, the date is 1993. There was the softening at the end of the Cold War. I'd been going around the secret museum, and then I sat down with the former KGB officer, he'd been under Radio Moscow cover, who had been sending all the stuff to me, and actually went through some of their operations. I picked up one, one thing that was genuine American documents, what had worked, what hasn't. So on that basis, from the horse's mouth, so to speak, inside the Lubyanka, I know that this was coming from the Russians because I met the people who did it. And as I was sitting there with uh, Colonel Alexei Petrovich Kandarov, who later went on to the Duma, he very kindly made me the traditional offer of payment. And the payment would be for writing for the new security service magazine, English language edition. I thought, well, new world, you know, are you going to pay me in hard currency, Colonel? He said, yeah, yeah, rubly, rubly, rubles. So I thought, well, you know, let's, let's at least have it in the traditional method. Can I have it through dead drops in Hyde Park? And he said, yeah. It will have to be Gorky Park. We are facing very severe budget restrictions. <laughs> I didn't take that job. <laughs> uh, but it is informative to have lived through one phase and look at how it works and actually see it from the other side. And I look forward very much to the discussion and our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> well, Ian, um, yeah, did you want to speak from your experience on, yeah, on no, the, I'll, subject, I'll do. the broad subject? I'll do it from him. So my name's Ian Coburn. I'm a reporter. I've been for uh, a great many years. A long time ago now, uh, an editor asked me, apropos of absolutely nothing, he said, uh, Ian, what are journalists compromised by? And I said, well, I, I don't know. What, what are we compromised by? And he said, well, <clears throat> we're not compromised by money because we never have any. And we're not compromised by fame because we never have any fame either. Journalists are compromised by their friendships. And what he meant was that we shouldn't get too close to the people we're reporting upon. And we shouldn't let them get too close to us. Now, a few years ago, I, was, uh, I spotted one or two things which led me to believe that the, that the British state was involved in quite serious human rights abuses in the years after 9-11 and 7-7. And I started... Um, peeling layers away as best I could and dealing with the sort of denial and the obfuscation and the official secrecy. Uh, and eventually I, I could see that actually we were up to our necks in very serious um, human rights abuses. And it's only really this year that the British state started to um, publicly acknowledge this. Uh, and I also, as a result of that, started to go back and have a look again at the way in which we waged um, our counter-terrorism or if you prefer our counter-insurgency operations in Northern Ireland. And I found that, um, that uh, we fought terror with terror, absolutely. 
Now, while I was doing this, there were occasions when I wondered whether I was under surveillance. And, um, and I may well have been. I, I, certainly, I could see I was in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh because it was very obtrusive. Um, uh, British agencies tend to be a lot, uh, pretty unobtrusive, I would imagine. So it's difficult to know. Um, with one exception, I decided I wasn't going to get at all uh, anxious about this. I decided that if I was under surveillance, that um, I needed to be very careful about the way in which I spoke to people. I wrote people letters. I went to see them. I met them in, um, I met them in places where we couldn't be watched, when we had no phones and such like. But by and large, I decided I was going to relax about this and if, uh, you know, actually pity whoever it was that might be listening to me because most of the time they'd find me just ringing my wife to ask whether I needed to pick up any groceries on the way home or, or wittering on to old friends about whether or not Everton should be playing three or four at the back this season. Nothing, they wouldn't have heard anything uh, much of, uh, of great interest at all. And to come back to the subject of the, uh, this talk, what should we be afraid of? I'm not sure that it should be uh, surveillance because it's, whilst the technological capacity of the state has obviously increased greatly in recent years, that's caused problems as well as opportunities for eavesdroppers, I would have thought. The agencies have found themselves in a position where, as uh, David Oman, the former um, British government security and intelligence coordinator put it, they found themselves uh, drinking at a fire hose. And, um, but it, it's always been there, it's always been there. Um, there's a woman I know called Anne McHardy, who was the Guardian's Belfast correspondent back in the late 70s. She found herself uh, at a dinner sitting next to the uh, press officer, the main press officer for Roy Mason, who was the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland at that time. And this man got very drunk and very loudly, everybody at this dinner table could hear him talking about how he and Roy had been listening to Anne's arguments with her boyfriend, uh, who was in London. And um, the, the, he then disclosed some of the details of these arguments. It was obvious that, that he had indeed been listening. Anne takes the view, if they'd been listening to her making arrangements to go and meet somebody from the IRA or a loyalist paramilitary organization, that would be within the rules of the game, but not listening to her uh, rows with her boyfriend. And the reason why I tell that story is just to make the point that it's not new. There's nothing new. Two years earlier, Duncan found himself arrested after a, a, a tele particular telephone call was, was intercepted. There's nothing new in this. A couple of years ago, Snowden's disclosures showed that, the, 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 again and again, if every, every generation has its, has its um, uh, signals intelligent whistleblower. 1950s, it was a couple of guys called Miller and Thompson, um, and then uh, Chapman Pincher in the 1960s, Duncan had his sources in the 1970s, and we kind of forget now and again what, what the state is capable of in terms of surveillance. And another whistleblower comes forward and tells us again. You can bet your life that after that happened, that the agencies will have decided not to increase their surveillance, but to increase their ability to get close to the journalists who are reporting on them. And they would have basically started working, they would have started trying to forge kind of friendships. And there will have been journalists who will have been foolish enough to think that the agencies were their friends. Not that they can talk to them on a friendly basis, but that they, are, that, that they really are friends with MI5 and MI6 and such like. And that's, uh, if we're going to think about what we should be afraid of, that's what I think journalists and um, trainee journalists, tomorrow's journalists, need to really think carefully about. How you keep a bit of distance between yourselves and the people you're going to report upon. Not so much how you need to protect what it is that you're saying over the phone. Um, in terms of the experience that I've had in the last few years in Germany, in terms of the question of what we should be afraid of, it's really uh, interesting to hear what you said because we had a period basically kind of starting with the WikiLeaks revelations in 2010 and was snowed in 2003 where there was really kind of... Um, you know, a prog spring of journalism that was going on in Germany. There was a lot of very critical journalism about the government, the government's role with the United States, um, um, the government role in the American drone program. There's, there was a very interesting material that was coming out, and there was a lot of adversarial journalism that was shooting upwards. Um, and it's really quite interesting to see where that went and how it disappeared, right? Because... Um, I remember when we did the Snowden film, which was about how Snowden 
with the help of activists from WikiLeaks and um, Sarah Harrison, was able to kind of escape out of uh, Hong Kong. Um, and our film broadcast in January 15, um, and it was basically, it was a few days after Charlie Hebdo happened in Paris. And it's very interesting to see what's happened since then, because the, uh, the terrorism reporting around national security took uh, and became the central um, kind of reporting that goes on on national security issues. Um, at the same time, we had the development of a very interesting person um, in the German government, the, who until recently was the head of the domestic intelligence service, uh, a man named Massen. And he was the first person who came out in January 15, um, um, going on about how Edward Snowden was a Russian spy. And he then, um, I mean, so when we're talking about what to be afraid of, um, <laughs> there's surveillance, and that's very important. There's also plain bullying by governments. So Massen began his career earlier, and in, in, he was involved in uh, a German um, named Murat Kurnatz, who was in Guantanamo. He was a kind of personally intervened in his case to make sure that Murat Kurnatz stayed in Guantanamo longer than actually the US government wanted him to be. Um, he then, after he began his campaign that Snowden was a, was a Russian spy, which by the way, the NSA doesn't even say, right? The, I, mean, that's, I mean, he really is a unique person in claiming this in the Western intel world. Then he filed treason charges, treason charges against a uh, German uh, web newspaper called Netzpolitik, which had uh, um, published some exclusive secret documents uh, on the domestic intelligence services um, uh, budget. Um, <clears throat> and um, he has basically, and it's come out now since he was removed from his post, which I'll get to in a second, basically had a stable of journalists who he fed domestic intelligence service, uh, domestic intelligence service information about terrorism. I mean, that's at least what's been reported. Um, he eventually was thrown out of the, his job as uh, head of domestic intelligence service because he had met repeatedly with uh, members of the far right uh, German AFD party, the alternative for Germany, this kind of anti-Islam, uh, anti-immigrant um, party, which is actually doing quite well now. And he was given a job in the interior ministry. The, 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 the point that I just want to make is that in plain bullying, plain kind of government shenanigans, you know, kind of which has existed forever, is also very real. And also in a country like Germany that likes to sell itself as this <clears throat> model of enlightenment thought and democratic, um, you know, he was, you know, he's, he's still there now in the interior ministry, um, continuing to do his work. Yeah, of course, the most obvious example is Donald Trump repeatedly calling the press the enemy of the people, which, you know, at this point, we're sort of inured to his tweets in a way, but it, we've also seen how that has been linked to real world examples of violence. It's very interesting to me that, that, uh, that you all seem to uh, respond to the question, uh, what should we be afraid of, is saying, well, it's not really so much surveillance anymore. But just to sort of push back on that a little bit, um, what we've seen in the US is that the, the capacity, the technological capacity of the government to track down everything about a journalist's communications with their sources is extraordinary at this point. Um, and you know, it's very difficult to protect sources in that environment. Um, and you know, I was curious, Ian, and maybe Duncan, you too could speak to what what methods do you think, I mean, is it back to in-person meetings or, I mean, is there, is there any hope of, of, of preserving the, that relationship in this environment where, you know, they can basically find out anything they want? 
Well, I always think it's better for journalists to meet people face to face if they can. It's good to just look at people's faces when you're talking to them. Yeah. It's as simple as that, really. Yeah. Uh, you, you, that limits you slightly geographically. If you want to talk to somebody in Australia, that's not going to be so easy. But when you can, I think you should go to see somebody. And if it puts you at some inconvenience, that's just too bad. You should go and see them. Um, and when you're with them, it is a lot easier to, um, to talk without being listened to. If you haven't got your phone with you, then you can talk without... And somebody once said to me, Oh, but what about lip readers? Well, not if you're both sitting in a church and you're the only people in the church and you're watching the door. There's no lip readers there, you know? So it is possible to go and meet people and to actually have communications with individuals without people listening in. And, of course, I, I believe in writing letters. Um, I think writing letters is great. I, I'm assuming that MI5 no longer has teams of people sitting in basements of buildings steaming open letters, oh, you know? They do, they do. <laughs> they photograph, the US government photographs every piece of mail. Right, but uh, w one of the problems with this discourse, I think, is that uh, not all journalistic projects carry the same level of risk. I mean, we particularly have a focus on the very high end and the paradigm and most extreme risk taker was Edward, um, stands head and shoulders. Now, journalists, I am sorry, despite the training, despite the good work that Gavin and his successors will do, are crap at uh, protective security. And particularly in the modern age, if they think everything's got to be electronic, you are uh, negated from the word go. But there's a lot of stories that require hard investigative graft that don't really carry that level of risk because you're not dealing with a principal state. If, you're, if, you're, if you are exposing the corruption of a major corporation, that is not allied to a defense contracting sector, then your risk level is way down. Because, you know, whatever we say about NSA and GCHQ and their like, they don't share shit with nobody. They've got, to, they've got to have an interest to give their intercepted material out and a reason to target it, actually. They're very bureaucratic, they're very compliant. So one of the problems is scaling the journalistic protections appropriately. You know, in our health service, which is going crazily bad, there is story after story from nurses, doctors, contractors. These people don't even need encryption to safely tell us their stories. There's nobody in health service protective stuff who's got the competence or the skill or the access to penetrate the channels of communication. You just need basic common sense, utter understanding of legal processes. And it's a weakness of journalism. You know, we move on. If we're taking on an important new source, whether it's come out of a secret intelligence agency or from a company, you have to take on a role of pastoral care. Mm -hmm. You actually, I, I find myself with a new whistleblower, the first thing I do is I, I act like a family doctor. Who's there for you? Who can protect you? You're gonna go through shit. I'm not even gonna be very forthcoming to you about the shit that lies ahead in your next years. And your belief systems are going to have to change several times. If I want to help you, I ask the family doctor questions. Who's there for you? What's your family? Mm -hmm. Is your partner, husband, life, lover, strong for you? Mm -hmm. Are your parents? You know? And I don't think that's taught anywhere. But if you're really trying to bring somebody who's going to do something major good, and then you look at, say, somebody like Edward, he worked because he did it all himself. He did his own risk assessment, his own forward planning, mm -hmm. and only in the latter stages were journalists coming in to provide some kinds of rescue. And he made the very important choice of coming forward and you know, being the most powerful advocate for his own story, which you know, in most cases when you're dealing with that type of source, it, it's more of anonymity, which raises a whole other host of issues for journalism. Um, I mean, in the U.S., we have a big debate about there, a lot of journalism relies on anonymous sources who are, you know, applying a particular agenda, sometimes from within intelligence agencies. Is that something that you have confronted, Ian? Um, <coughs> I've found that um, the Britain's agencies won't talk to me <coughs> any longer. <coughs> um, uh, MI6 made it clear that they will never talk to Ian Cobain ever again. <laughs> well, that's because <laughs> that's you're fine. doing the right kind of journalism. Well, that's fine. Um, <laughs> and MI5 made a sort of slightly cackling yeah. attempt to sort of get close to me at one point. Um, and um, uh, so I, 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 
I, I don't really receive many leaks from, from that direction um, at all. Um, I'm usually using open sources. And also, people, I, I try to talk to people on, on the receiving end of their operations. That's the, way I, that's the way I do it. And I don't need to be close to them because I regard my role as, 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 as being, you know, standing at the back and lobbing bottles, really, you know, rather than trying to get, forge friendships with people. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there's an awful lot of material that, um, that is in the public domain, or I, I work through people who aren't journalists. I don't want to say too much about that, but people will talk to non-journalists more than they'll talk to journalists. Academics, for example, yeah. lawyers. So that's, you know, I sort of, that, that's the way I tend to work. Um, I, I wondered if, if you all had followed the story around the reporting um, that the New York Times and the New Yorker did around Harvey Weinstein. Um, there was a, a story about Black Cube, an Israeli intelligence firm that was actually uh, trying to manipulate the, the journalists. Have you seen any examples of like that here? It's all over the place. It's not often as professional as that. Um, the uh, oil multinationals have employed those kind of operators, those kind of agencies. Historically, the tobacco companies did. Um, and it's related to the disinformation that you referred to at the, at the outset. Well, it's, I mean, it's, all about controlling, it's all about controlling the narrative. I mean, yeah. the problem about buddying up to SI, our secret service, and so on, uh, or MI5 is they're going to give you the information that advances your narrative. If they're playing a clever game, they'll give you true information. That's a smart move. Um, but it's not the information that they give you. It's the information they don't give you. It's right. important. And that's, a that, that's just true everywhere. It's not, it's not um, the open information. Is the critical question is what's missing from this picture? Mm -hmm. And often you, you can interrogate that by saying, what is this person not telling me that's obvious from where she is coming from and wants to achieve? Yes. And we've even seen that in sets of documents that look extremely revealing and pointing in one direction, but then we realize that they are missing certain key documents that would tell, you know, paint a totally different picture. Yeah. Yeah, so you I, have I, to be very skeptical of everything you receive. Well, that was very funny because, I mean, most of the Russian stuff apart from the utter rubbish that I got in the Cold War, was like that. You couldn't use it because you, you couldn't really, you would be able to check it out enough, but you could, you know, they're missing out the stuff. Right. It's not, there's too much missing here. There was just one, one set I remember. They got a spy stolen the atomic war plans, which included preemptive bombing of Finland and Sweden mm -hmm. to deny territory, which is absolutely shocking. I got enough American sources signed up to say that's 100% correct. I said, no. Oh, KGB sent this, and I now know they did. Fuck it. I publish, and I say, this has probably come from the KGB. And uh, now I know the chap who sent it to me. <laughs> so yes, um, it's, it's, it is open sources. It's knowing what's missing um, when you grill people. It's knowing the question to ask. It's craft and tradecraft, as you were saying, Ian. And as far as the manipulation of journalists is concerned, in the UK, there doesn't have to be any great sophistication in an attempt to do so, because a, a great many journalists in this country will willingly allow themselves to be manipulated in, if they think it's a good story. They'll, they'll, they'll take it. In, in the, and it's not, again, there's nothing new in this. In the 1920s, a, a, a British civil servant wrote this wonderful ditty, which I'm going to try and remember. From. He said, um, you cannot hope to bribe or twist. Thank God, the British journalist. But when you see what the man will do unbribed, there is no occasion to. <laughs> so uh, I, that's, that's, the, that's the, you know, I hold true today, 100, almost 100 years later, I think. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things about the surveillance state and, the, and the, the data, the world of data, that we've all kind of been warned about and worried about, I mean, there's also a way to turn a lot of that information around and use it in an interesting way. I mean, we, we were involved in a bigger project where we went out and found the the CIA kidnappers who kidnapped uh, a German uh, who had been Khalid al-Masri, and kind of using 
you know, flight records and pilot records and kind of working backwards, we were able to use open source material to actually, in the end, identify 150 people involved in the entire rendition program. And then we went down to North Carolina back when that happened to actually confront the people who had kidnapped this German citizen, right? And where the German government had done very little to, actually until this day, um, that's a very to do good, anything. I mean, the, the, there's this notion that you can, you can umfunktionieren, and you can you can take um, the the apparatus and turn it the other way, and, and and I think the idea that we're always just victims of big data and just victims of the of all of this um, forgets that we can also be creative and and flip things around. Well, there's a huge industry of large-scale data journalism, and it's making great advances. It requires having your own army of techies, but I mean the the example you give. Um, even more fantastic work was done by Stephen Gray, name check, will be here later. Um, and Stephen used very big data analysis. In fact, it's the, Stephen used one of the key intelligence analysis tools, the, the I2 system. The first time I'd ever seen a journalist really use that tool correctly to distill through data and actually pull out from a mass of data, mass surveillance, but our mass surveillance of the airline records, and actually pull out analytically where the CIA rendition flights were. Um, and that was quite an extraordinary thing to watch. That's a very high level of skill, and it's a serious technical skill, and few journalists would even know of the tool, um, let alone how to deploy it. Coda to that, Later on, we picked up that one of the aircraft that Stephen identified flew out on an unscheduled mission to Europe, just as they thought they might get Edward spirited back out of Moscow. Oh. They actually sent one of these planes. It stopped in Copenhagen. Copenhagen, yeah. It had stopped in Copenhagen and filed it. And we, spot, we got that story from um, an open source ish, which is a, a network of radio listeners who would track the flights, and if the flights weren't appearing in the normal database, they go, woo, okay, what's this? What do we know about this aircraft? So we actually had that story while the aircraft was still on its approach to uh, Copenhagen Airport. Um, it didn't happen, thank God. But, but there's either. also, if you look at uh, MC McGrath, who's here today, uh, has done this thing called IC Watch, and it's a website where he's using open source, using kind of uh, fair methods, has managed to compile a data bank of tens of thousands of members of the American intelligence community. It's called IC Watch. And it's online, and you can go through and search for names, search for work that they did. And it's really worth looking at, and that's all open source. I mean, so my point is, is, that, is that it's very easy, I think, in a lot of these kind of discussions, you know, people just feel defeated by this kind of massive... Um, surveillance data flood. And I just think that it's more interesting and funner to figure out how to use it to, to, to do journalism. Yeah. LinkedIn is often a very good tool for that kind of, to look at the connections. I mean, do you, do you use that? I, I, I'm, like, I'm always astonished at the amount of information people put about themselves yeah. on LinkedIn, including yeah. intelligence officers. What on earth are you telling me that for? You know? <laughs> yeah. And then all the connections are there, you know? And job adverts, online job adverts, yes. incredibly yes. revealing sometimes. Yes. They're good, but I mean, you know, um, <laughs> unless you've got that 5% or 10% of secret intelligence from the inside, I mean, for years, by that precisely that method, those of us who specialized in NSA knew the names of all the big programs, Marina, Mainway, Ghost Rider, you know, whatever. You saw them because they came up on the resumes. You could, if you knew something of the deployments, you could guess what that area was. But, you know, it, until the precision of actually having the volumes of material that said, yeah, this is this and this is this. And even now, you know, people are still pretty loose in their understanding of where all the material is out there to, to, to be precise. So, yes. You, know, you were... You were asking one of your questions, um, you know, what are the technical developments for the future? This is something I think we have to be terribly alert to. Um, I, I've always banged on to people in this kind of thing about, oh, you know, Britain's overwhelmed with TV cameras and forget them. And the reason is that there's no systematic way of using that to get personal data at the moment. 
And on the other side, on the police side, if you actually see how um, the camera images are used by the result of hundreds of detectives poring over them to find when some bloody murderer or serial rapist or vicious terrorist actually moved, um, you can see the help it does. The other thing that people forget about, and I don't know how bad it is in the US, is vehicle recognition, vehicle number plates. Uh, in one of the most covert operations ever, notes had the intelligence services, they rolled out for the last 20 years a quite dense network of tracking every vehicle in the UK with no parliamentary authority, no discussion, no oversight. Um, it was smuggled through by getting individual police forces to get their local authorities to fund another little bit of what was actually a national surveillance project. And, you know, to, to add to the other things about meeting, um, a source like that, if you, if you can be as old-fashioned as we are. I feel there's not many people do that. But if you can be, my tip is don't take your car and tell your source not to take a car to the meeting. Because as soon as you do that, you have the car travel version of the collision theory of who's in the same place at the same time, which we can now see as a very systematic method. Even things like an oyster card. And cause all sorts of problems right. for people, uh, two people. Yes, don't use an oyster card. An oyster card, for those of you not Londoners, is a, a card which you can use to move around the London public transport system. And if you have a registered card, you don't have to, um, then all your movements are tracked. Um, now, quite simply, um, using a device for catching as many as possible of the phones are in your, this room, or just if they've got large scale network access, um, it's almost trivial to capture who's 70% of who are here. And if this wasn't, in fact, a public gathering, but a, a convocation of, of journalists and their sources, they would have every, every single person. And they wouldn't have to do it by telephone tapping or communications data analysis if they've got your movements. And what's coming in the future, and very fast, is face recognition, automated large-scale face recognition. The algorithms have become far more powerful, far more quickly than most people saw. You can pretty much see it in the way that Facebook deploys it. You can scale that in your imaginations, you'll be correct, to what happens when you plug that kind of thing into the camera network at the density we've got in Britain. And that is extraordinary, because where's the counter for that? Well, you can go back to your I spy 16-year-old book and just take a variety of handy disguises, I suppose. <laughs> um, but you'll have to read into the technology to understand how to configure your disguises to disguise your facial parameters. It goes crazy. The answer, of course, is to control the people who are doing this. <laughs> Unfinished job. Um, I want to go back to uh, a question, something that Mr. Campbell uh, brought up. Uh, and I want to bring it back to uh, local journalism because obviously everything starts somewhere and like one of the things with local journalism is exactly what Mr. Campbell told us is it's not what it, it's what they don't tell us within local journalism and how then can we bring that more to the attention of the people locally uh, so for instance usually nine times out of ten planning applications are made by multinational companies who hide behind an agent, for instance. Um, so how can that be brought more to the fore? Do you want to, respond? Do you want, do you want to speak to local? Well, uh, the hollowing out of the local press in, yes. in, in the United Kingdom and elsewhere is a tremendous, uh, is a tremendous problem because it's, it's, uh, it, it, it undermines local accountability and local democracy. Um, there are occasions, there, there are one or two, there's still some local papers which are, which are thriving. I was down in Dorset a little while ago looking at the Dorset Echo, still in good shape. Um, and uh, the, um, a couple of, uh, the newsletter of all papers in Northern Ireland seems to be getting better and better. And, um, and there are a couple of local news um, websites and um, the Brixton Bugle, for example, which has been launched recently, which is which is which is uh, filling a gap. But I, I do uh, lament the decline of the local paper. I'm not too sure. It's it, 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 the economics of it is uh, is the problem there. The fact that they're no longer making money. Back in the 70s and 80s, they were licensed to print money, as far as I could see. Advertising then went online. 
I wonder whether we're going to have to rely upon um, volunteers a little more. One of the things which I've considered is in a couple of years' time when I'm in my, not quite in my dotage, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, no longer working for a living, maybe I could apply myself to some local journalism where I live in South East London. I, I, I don't know what the answer is really. Um, I, it's difficult to see how journalists, journalism can make money uh, at, a very, at a truly local level. It's a, it's a major crisis in the U.S. Um, at the state level, um, the decimation of, of local news outlets, um, and there is massive corruption in state legislatures that is basically going unchallenged and unreported. And, you know, to some extent, foundations are stepping in and providing some support to local journalists, but it's, it's nothing like it once was. So that is, there's no real clear path in sight to restore that kind of accountability. It is an encouragement that non-government organizations, which are not ipso facto journalists, are stepping into this breach. And some of the very highest quality work and say torture, rendition, civil liberties, certainly in this country, is, is now coming out of that sector. Not because the journalists like us are not capable of it, it's just most, most journalists are no longer employed to work on something as hard as that or as long as that. Right. Um, question right there. Um, my question has to do, well, it's more a, yeah, it is an open-ended question. It has to do with what you said about facial recognition coming on in leaps and bounds. Yes, it has. Voice recognition too. Yes, it has. Um, so, if we have armies of techies on the sides of journalists, say, presenting, um, working for them. You don't need an army, really, but you could have somebody implementing the exact mirror of what's being implemented against journalists and against the public. For example, neural networks, AI machines. So what's to stop us or the public from implementing AI machines to dis or help to help journalists find out what is real, what is fake, to see trends, to learn trends, to alert, and then to put out, um, you know, campaigns against that. And in doing that, where does this escalation stop? And they, they come against us, we go against them, they come against us, we go against them. When does, where does it stop? Is a stop a total removal of all, everything technical? And going back to, you know, basic manual reporting, manual everything, I don't see that as happening. So how do we address this escalation of them using AI, us using AI, and you know, sort of back and forth, back and forth? Do you want to take I think AI is still at the present time overstated on all sides, so, so maybe park that. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of clever tech people and the kind of things that Logan and CIJ organize classically bring together some hot shit tech people with ideas like that. Um, and, and try and bring them in touch with the journalist community. I think all of that is great, but all of the time I'm looking at, do you really need this, this solution? You know, isn't this just our version of a, a company saying, hey, I've got the letters great thing? Is it actually appropriate for your um, technological position? Now, there are some, and uh, I've even taken part with my partner in developing some that we think are really useful for journalists and we put them out there if we, if we could, that are simple and cheap ways of getting around privacy problems that you have against the global surveillance empire. But to do this in a systematic way belays the nature of us as individuals and, and small groups. Um, we're never going to win everything anyway. They're never going to win anything. That is written across the whole of history. Um, Every, every version will be imperfect. Um, is there a technical solution to guarding against the pernicious effects of facial recognition and voice recognition technologies? Pervasively, no. On a single case basis, on a small group basis, probably, though I hear you know, arguments for and against. Um, AI, uh, don't go there for 10 years at least because most of what's been claimed for AI in governance sphere is the latest buzzfeed. I mean, yeah, the intelligence agencies I know in the US have 
are, are going to everybody on AI and saying, what do you got? What can you tell us about? What can we use? But they always did that, you know, when they invented the first motor cars, they wanted to, wanted to be like that. Uh, so don't go too techy and look all around you as you go in and just ask, is, my, is the degree of risk appropriate? Is, the, is this going to work? And most importantly, and quite often, is it going to work when it actually matters? Are we going to remember how to do it? Right. Question. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much indeed. Um, my, my question um, really follows on from Mr. Campbell's answer and, and his earlier comment that the, the, the answer, if there is one, is to control uh, the people who do this. Um, do you think that um, management controls within the organizations that have access to all this data are keeping up with the technological change and do you feel that the oversight of that management by external parliament and the commission that oversees the agencies are um, keeping up with this? I would just say um, I've um, worked with, not for, I might stress, and certainly not for payment, with um, former members of the GRU and I perhaps give some reassurance, only partial reassurance to the audience, that when I was in customs and excise, at the turn of the century, customs and excise was in a very, very bad way with misgovernance and corruption. And it was actually senior managers from MI5 and 6 <coughs> who were brought in to sort it out. And they very much did sort it out and they restored integrity and cleared out some very dubious behavior. The, the person who came, I saw this firsthand, the person who came to my unit is now the Director General of MI5. And it's not just what he did, it's how he did it. So we always have to be vigilant, but I wonder if there's a, I, I think that the basic, I would fear cock up more than conspiracy. I, I think data is going way ahead of the human ability to handle it effectively and ethically. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, a good point. Does anyone want to respond? Uh, that's, uh, that's an amazing contribution. Uh, yeah. We are on notice here of people speaking conspiracy theorists. You, sir, I know your story and I know who you're talking about in customs and exercise. I went after the ring leader of that about eight years earlier and he only moved upwards. Um, I, I hope you might be invited to, to take a platform at the next conference if you are um, able to do so. But before that, your, your point was about regulating the agencies. Now, one of your questions, Betsy, was what has Snowden done? Have we made big changes? We got a whole new act, Investigatory Powers Act. It was almost everything they wanted, but they were very much more transparent about it. A lot of stuff was put out there. Um, a story I'd been trying to chase for years, I knew it was true, but I never had enough proof for editors that all our phone numbers and all our phone calls in Britain were being secretly recorded, while even the cops were being told that they were only held for a year. And then one day in Parliament, a certain person went onto the podium, went onto the dispatch box and gave away the entire story. Her name was Theresa May. She was then the Home Secretary and she revealed that they had secretly been using powers under a 1984 law to take all the data on everyone's phone calls and even lie to the police and every lawyer and every judge about them doing that. What we got out of that um, in a long fought battle, we had a good few Americans over to try and help Parliament, but we didn't have the numbers in our dumb fool establishment. So, uh, they got almost everything on the laws, but what civil society got was a new regulator, the investigatory, um, investigatory powers commissioners. And uh, the person first appointed to it was actually Britain's first openly gay judge to the Human Rights Court, a very serious High Court judge. And his first act as the top commissioner was not to get MI5 and MI6 in to brief all the 
semi-retiree judges that would be his deputies, he called us in. He called in the NGOs. He said, I want you to brief them first. Um, uh, I shouldn't say the name in a public forum, but um, for his investigative staff, subject to clearances, which are being pushed through, he is going to have people from NGOs going to the agencies with all the top secret clearances now given to them and saying, we're going to see what you're doing. And, it, you know, they're setting a standard for publication. So what's that? That's like 100% worse and then 15% better. Um, but it is a step change. Um, a lot of serious people, and you must have taken part in these debates too, worry about where there is a real public interest in some of the claims for surveillance against the wholesale slowing into every citizen's data. And one of the areas of answers is you create very powerful countervailing forces, empowered regulators who can go anywhere, anytime, ask for any file and impose punishments cause people to be sacked. Is that the best we're going to get? Well, probably, but, you know, let's kick it open. It's not what we right. want. And it doesn't answer the vast question of what to do about private companies that are sitting on these enormous amounts of personal no, data. It's a whole other question. Um, I think we have time for one last quick question. Where's the... Over here? I've been waiting a long time. Go ahead. Um, uh, during my uh, checkered career, I uh, was at one time a, a science advisor to the Chief of Naval Operations in the United States. And I had uh, a need to get uh, quite a bit of access to intelligence as I, I was more technical and policy. And the thing that has always amazed, and since then I know a lot of people in high level jobs. Um, the thing that impresses me most about the intelligence agencies is how wrong they can be, how incompetent so much of the activities in these agencies are. And in fact, I, I have a joke with many of the people I still talk to. I say, uh, you know, I'm going to talk with you and I'm going to give you access to unclassified information. And in fact, uh, it's, it's very common. Um, that people in high-level positions who are getting, uh, who, who, who basically uh, rely on the intelligence community don't read the newspapers carefully enough and actually have beliefs that are really uh, ridiculous. I mean, just totally out of whack with what the most likely situation is. So um, this is different from what you've been talking about here, but I think there is a... Uh, 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 a um, pernicious effect of this kind of incompetence at the intelligence agencies that also leads to highly misinformed leadership. And I just wanted yeah. to That's raise a, that question. It's an excellent point. We run out of time, so but I know you've been waiting for yeah, a long I, time. Well, so if it, you can just be very brief. It's attached. It's okay. attached. I casually just wanted to say something at the Frontline Club and also the Byline Festival. Um, Carol called Wallet or Paul put up, why are we as journalists doing investigative stuff like Cambridge Analytica, what the government should be doing, because the journalists don't have a budget for that. The other thing at the Frontline Club, we always ask, you know, when there's sensitive things about, um, anyway, we ask who's in the audience, who is working for the government. I like to know before I speak who is working for MI5, because they always infiltrate at the Frontline Club. Mm -hmm. And if there are people working for NMOD or whatever, they should make themselves known. Yeah. The other thing is, I agree totally. I come from documentary, and that's how I knew Gavin and World in Action, because we chased Nazis for 30, 40 years. And so we had CIA guys coming to us afterwards. And at Sundance, I always asked Laura Poitras and the people that were in her films, CIA never used to be allowed to talk. Now they talk free and e easily to cameras. So that's, yeah. that's like a whole different Change. element. So yes. voila. That's okay. It. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, all panelists. This is very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.